If you've ever seen that old Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Steven Spielberg directed it, it was Harrison Ford was in it, and Indiana Jones was this explorer that went out to find the Ark of the Covenant, to retrieve it and uh, to take it away from the Nazis that were about to use it for some terrible, terrible purpose. And in that movie, the Ark of the Covenant is this beautiful golden box but historically, the Ark of the Covenant was always understood from the Old Testament. It was the Old Testament symbol of the dwelling of God in the midst of his people. And you might wonder, what has a metal box, a golden box, empty apart from a few documents and the tablets and one or two other things, what does this box have to do with Jesus? How can there be anything in common with the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus in the New Testament? Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. My name is Rory McClure and I'd like to welcome you to this time of worship as we come to the Word of God. And as we look at the Old Testament, sometimes the Old Testament seems to us a closed book and we wonder, what has this to do with our Christian lives today? And we ignore those glorious stories, but today... We're going to be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 13. But as we do so, we come in an attitude of praise and worship. We come at God's invitation. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. We're going to sing a song that we haven't sung in a while in these videos. It's Behold Our God, a wonderful modern song that just helps us to uh, behold the glory and the wonder of our God. Will you sing this with me? Who 
hearts of sinful men. God eternal, humble to the grave. Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on His throne. Come, let us adore. splendor, your might, and your majesty. And we never want to under, underestimate you, dear Lord, but we are inadequate to grasp you in all of your fullness. And so now, Lord, send down your Holy Spirit. May he lift our hearts into heaven, and we may, may we, by faith, behold more of your glory. May we have a greater sense of who Jesus is, of his great authority over us, and of his a tremendous love for us. Bless us and help us now, dear Lord, as we devote this time to you. Help us not to be distracted by the things that are happening around us, but to remain focused on who Jesus is, so that we will be blessed as we spend this time with you, and that you will be glorified. And we pray this in the mighty and majestic name of our Saviour, our Lord, and our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to continue our attitude of worship as we sing Amazing Grace, and this is the one with the modern chorus, My Chains Are Gone. Sing this with joy in your heart, knowing God's amazing grace for you.
bow your head and pray again with me. Our God and Father, our mighty provider, our rock, our strength, our healer, we come to you, dear Lord. We come with our own personal needs, our own sense of inadequacy, our own need for forgiveness. We look to that cross, dear Lord, and we ask that you would forgive us afresh. But we also ask that you would heal us and bless us. You would provide for us. You would overcome in these times of difficulty. And Lord, we pray for your mercy for us as a church. Lord, there are many challenges for us as a church facing us. We want to pray for your blessings on uh, Yvonne and on Peter Pan and it breaks our heart to know that that wonderful work uh, that uh, has been happening in our building has come to an end. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would help all of the staff that looked after those children to find new jobs. Our hearts go out to them. We pray, dear Lord, that you would draw them into the life of this church and that they wouldn't forsake this building, but rather they would be curious to come for themselves and discover the whole reason for this building, which is you, O oh Lord. We pray that you would provide for us and that you would continue to enable your work to continue at Parkside. We pray that you would expand uh, our numbers, you would expand uh, your work in our midst and help us, dear Lord, to be faithful witnesses to you. Lord, we want to be good stewards of the resources that you have given us as a congregation. But we also dedicate ourselves to you at this difficult time. We're aware, Lord, that prices are going up and there is fear in people's hearts as people try to uh, plan for uh, the, this, this coming winter and for the future. We give great wisdom to our government, make, help them to make wise decisions on behalf of the poor, help them not to, uh, be, uh, to exasperate the problems. Oh, Father God, please, in your mercy, hear our call, provide for us. But more than this, dear Lord, we pray that you would expand your kingdom again. Draw people to Jesus and help them to see Jesus for who he truly is. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen. I like to get us to sing psalms in these services every now and again, and this is one of my favourite psalms. The Lord said to my Lord, it comes from Psalm 110, and this version really helps us to understand who God is. The same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Lord Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And this psalm is also the one that Jesus quoted the most. It's quoted again in the rest of the New Testament because it's so important. And when we understand that this psalm is all about Jesus, it helps us to appreciate and love him all the more. And so will you sing with me, The Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord from Zion sends your scepter in his strength. drink 
and therefore lift his head. We're going to come to the word of God now, and as always, we do so with reverence, asking that God would speak to us. Heavenly Father, please open our hearts, lead us into the truth, and let us behold glorious truths from your word, the Bible. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to continue our series in 1 Chronicles. We're up to chapter 13 now, and we're going to cover the whole of the chapter. Uh, but to make sense of what's happening in this, Ezra, as, he, as he's writing these chronicles, as he's, uh, as he's taking all of Israel's history, he's assuming a great familiarity with 1 and 2 Samuels and 1 and 2 uh, Kings. He's uh, assuming probably a greater familiarity of other documents that he references throughout these, uh, these chronicles uh, that we don't have access to, but we have everything that's important for us to know. And so he jumps into the story and he's assuming that we know the background. And it's possible that you don't know the Old Testament as well as you would like to know it. And so let me give you a little bit of the background so that as we read 1 Chronicles chapter 13, it will make a little bit more sense. The background of this story starts really with our understanding of what the Ark of the Covenant is and what it represents. The Ark of the Covenant was commanded to be built by Moses. It was a revelation given to Moses, and he went down from the Mount Sinai, and it was this golden box. And this golden box had in it a copy of the Ten Commandments. It had the, uh, a record of the covenant and the testimony, hence its name, the Ark of the Covenant. Another name that we could translate the Ark of the Covenant is the Box of the Covenant. After all, the, the Noah's Ark it was just one large box. But this ark, the Ark of the Covenant, had two cherubim over the top of it, overlooking the mercy seat, representing God's forgiveness, and had a mercy seat over the top of it that, so that when the blood was presented on it, uh, the, uh, the cherubim could only see the blood and not the law which condemns us. And it was an object of tremendous reverence and importance in the Old Testament system. It was at the very dwelling place of God himself uh, when the people of God entered the promised land, when they crossed the River Jordan. Uh, after Moses had died and after Joshua had taken responsibility for leading the people into the promised land, it was the Ark of the Covenant that led them in. It was the Ark of the Covenant that walked round the, uh, the walls of Jericho. And so this Ark, was known to have tremendous power. But a new generation came along and the old stories became familiar and people became superstitious. Uh, I want to sum up for you uh, the story that's contained in 1 Samuel chapter 4 to ch uh, chapter 7, verse 2. And in a time of tremendous conflict, at the end of the period of the judges, uh, the Philistines started to attack the Israelites, and the Israelites at this stage uh, went to, the, uh, to Shiloh. It was the, that was the location of the tabernacle, and inside the tabernacle, this holy tent, this, uh, this temple tent, uh, inside there was the Ark of the Covenant. They went to Shiloh, and uh, they'd heard the stories of the destruction of Jericho. They heard how important the Ark of the Covenant was. And in a superstitious way, they thought that they could take the Ark of the Covenant and use it basically as a weapon, a weapon against their enemies, that this was just a bit of military technology that they could take and that they could zap their enemies. So they took the Ark of the Covenant to Ebenezer, to Alphac, uh, where there, there was this great uh, conflict between the Philistines and the Israelites. But... God was not to be mocked. He wasn't to be manipulated. His ark, his, uh, this symbol that was so tremendously important about uh, uh, this visual reminder of the reverence that people ought to have towards God, he wasn't going to have it mocked or abused. And so he handed over the ark to the Philistines. Much to the horror of the Israelites, they saw this precious item, and it was precious. I mean, it was worth millions and millions and millions of pounds in today's money because of the sheer amount of gold that was on it. It was taken by the Philistines and taken down to Ashdod. 
And in the Ashdod, it was placed in the Philistine temple to a false god called Dagon. And overnight, the, the, the idol of da Dagon fell down. It fell off, off its plinth and it snapped in half in reverence, in brokenness, in, in defeat before the ark of the Lord. The Philistines were horrified at this. And not only that, God st started to send horrible diseases among them. And they said, we've got to get rid of this box. There's something terrifying about this, this Ark of the Covenant that we need to get rid of it. And so they gave it to the people, their fellow Philistines over in Gath. And it remained in Gath. And there the, uh, another plague broke out and started to infect many, many people. And great boils and uh, tumors overcame their skin and there the pagan priest said we've got to get rid of this and we have to offer a bribe to this god that is so terrifying to us and so they put the ark on the back of an ox cart and they, rather than putting oxen which were commonly used at that time for drawing carts they put two milk cows to milk cows, obviously, they're, uh, they're, ha they're, in, uh, they're having milk because they're feeding their calves and the instincts of those uh, milk cows would have been to go back to their calves to feed them. But instead, God overcame their instincts and those two milk cows drew that cart back to the Israelites. And this, uh, this um, cart with the Ark of the Covenant on the back of it ended up in Beth Shemesh. And in Beth Shemesh, the people of God saw the ark returning to them and they rejoiced. But sadly, again, the, uh, the reverence that they ought to have had over that ark. They just treated it as an object of curiosity. And 70 of them just went in to look at it. They were curious. It was a bit of a tourist attraction. And again, God's judgment came on the people of God and 70 of them died. And in their horror, they said, we need to get rid of this. And they handed it on from there and they brought it to Kiriath Jiram, Jairam. And there it remained for a long period of time. And during the reign of King Saul, he just ignored it. He was either indifferent to it or probably a bit frightened of it. And it was David, David's sincere design, uh, uh, desire to bring the Ark of the Covenant to its proper dwelling place. He wanted to bring it to Jerusalem. So that's the, that's the context that will help us to understand 1 Chronicles chapter 13. This is God's word to us today. David consulted with the commanders of thousands and hundreds, with every leader, and David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you and from the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel as well as to the priests and Levites in the cities that have pasture lands, that they might be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. All the assembled agreed to do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Lebohamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jairim, and David and all Israel went up to Baalah, that is, to Kiriath Jairim, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart from the house of Aminadab and Azah and Ahiah, who were driving the cart. And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all of their might, with song and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzziah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand to the ark. And he died there before God. And David was angry because of the, the Lord had broken out against Uzziah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark, of God, um, the ark home to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. 
And the ark of God remained with the household of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he had. What I want us to do with this passage is understand what Jesus and the Ark of the Covenant have in common with each other. And it may seem a ridiculous question. After all, you might think to yourself, they have nothing in common. One is a, uh, is a golden wooden box uh, that has a few bits and pieces inside, and one is the eternal living God. What could they possibly have in common? But first and foremost, I want us to think that uh, Jesus is the living, dwelling place of God. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament system was the, uh, represented the dwelling place of God. It even says it in our passage. It's the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. I have a picture here that you can see just up here uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, and you can see two angel-like beings leaning forward, and their wings are touching over the mercy seat. And that's those two Angels are called the cherubim, and the Lord dwelt above the cherubim. Some scholars uh, see this as symbolic as of the footstool of the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and others see it as his very throne. But either way, it's a reminder, a visible reminder, that God was pleased to dwell in the midst of his people. And this was no just mere religious trinket. This was a visible reminder, holy, special, a remarkable, extraordinary privilege, only given to the Israelites under the Old Testament system, uh, unique among all the peoples of, of the world, that God was pleased to dwell in the midst of his people. Another term that we come across later in uh, Old Testament history coming from the lips of Isaiah, was the term Emmanuel. That term that we use at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. And the Ark of the Covenant was this visible reminder that God is with us. He, it was the Emmanuel. And where the Ark was, there was that guarantee of the promise. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Promise. The, that promise that God would be pleased to dwell in the midst of his people. And it was an extraordinary thing that they had. Moses gave very, was given very, very strict instructions about how it was to be constructed. He shall cast four rings of gold on it and put them on its four feet and two rings on one side of it, two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put poles in the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. And so this box had two long poles on either side of it and it had to be carried by the priests themselves. In Numbers, we find out more details about that. When Aaron and his sons had finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishing of the sanctuary, including the Ark of the Covenant. As the camp sets out after the sons of Koath shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. And so there were strict instructions about how these extraordinary holy objects had to be treated with enormous reverence and care. And they came with a health warning as well. A second thing that, that I want us to think about, about what the Ark and Jesus have in common is public humility. Uh, we often see in pictures the ark being covered so that you can see the angels and the goldenness and the beauty of the ark, but we were given strict instructions in numbers that the ark shall have put on it a covering of goat skin and shall spread on top of that a cloth all of blue and they shall put in its poles. And so you can see in the picture up here an accurate art, artist's rendition. It doesn't look nearly as exciting uh, as we have des described and as artists often showed it, like that picture. No, this wealth, this gold, this splendor, this great mystery was veiled, veiled in cloth. I love the beginning of John's Gospel. 
At the beginning of John's Gospel in chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 of chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Another translation could say he tabernacled among us. He took on flesh. He veiled his glorious majesty. Nobody could see the mystery and the glory that was within. And outside it just looked ordinary. And God is pleased to dwell in the midst of his people. The mystery of God, the glory of God, the wonder of God, the extraordinary wealth of God. All of that God was pleased to have dwell dwell in the midst of his people, veiled, veiled in ordinariness. An ordinariness that hides from anybody that lacks the eyes of faith. The extraordinary wealth contained within. And that's what Jesus is. You can see the great reverence that people had. Again, we have this picture and uh, um, uh, this ordinary looking box, but people knew within there. Joshua, as he led the people in, gave strict instructions about how the ark was to be, uh, to be uh, treated. He, he had been taught at the feet of Moses. He had been trained for this. And after Mo- Moses passed away, he took on all the responsibility As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it of about 2,000 cubits in length. You can think about that's about a mile away. It's an extraordinary distance. They had to keep their distance. He says, do not come near it. So great was the reverence that they were supposed to have towards it. And so Jesus... Jesus comes veiled and he comes not demanding that everybody stay a safe distance away, but rather he goes and he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He lays his precious hands on the the blind, on the lame, on the cripples, on the lepers. He shows extraordinary love and he receives love from other people. That dwelling place of God, veiled in humility, living in our midst. In Isaiah, it says he had no beauty that we should desire him. And Jesus, I'm sure, uh, was just a very ordinary looking people. I doubt very, very much whether he was extraordinarily tall. I doubt very, very much if he was extraordinarily good looking. But he came in great, great humility. He was this mystery of God, the eternal Son of God, was pleased to dwell among us as an ordinary human being. Another thing that Jesus and the ark have in common was holiness and judgment. This is the part that everybody gets troubled about. They get so troubled about this that they just ignore the enormous blessing of this chapter, the tremendous excitement about it. And David and all Israel were celebrating uh, before God with all of their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. So you go from a period of extraordinary joy and happiness, and everybody thinks, this is great, God's with us, we've got him back, let's celebrate, yay, let's have a praise party. And yet the very next verse goes on to say, and when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And you think that that's exactly the right thing to do. The oxen have stumbled, the ark has been, uh, the cart has been jolted, and the ark is about to fall off. And uh, of course, Uzzah shouldn't have allowed it to fall on the ground. And yet, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he'd put out his hand to the ark, and he died before the Lord? What on earth is going on? This seems cruel. It seems unnecessary. Surely God wouldn't, be, uh, uh, wouldn't do that to anybody. But as I've reminded you again and again, there were very strict instructions about how this ark of the covenant was supposed to be carried. Um, uh, in Numbers, it says that they must not touch the holy things lest they die. And yet, David, David didn't follow the instructions that God had given to Moses. David rather 
treated this ark in exactly the same way that pagan priests had treated it. It was the pagan priests back in Gath that had the idea of putting the Ark of the Covenant on the back of an ox cart. It's David who heard these stories as he was growing up about the Ark uh, uh, being taken by these milk cows back. He, and yet, he rather than uh, listening to what the Word of God itself said about how the Ark of the Covenant should be treated, he just took these stories and he thought, well, if it's good enough for uh, the, uh, the Philistines, then it'll be good enough for me. Uh, I suspect this is me projecting our modern culture back into the ancient world. But I can imagine David uh, thinking to himself, oh, God is just wonderfully radically inclusive. God loves everybody. God uh, uh, doesn't want to exclude anybody. And so it's up to us as the people of God. We are the ones that need to change and accommodate ourselves in the most radically challenging way that's going to make us feel very uncomfortable. But we need to be so loving and inclusive that we take on these pagan ideas and we need to make, make these pagans feel comfortable. We, we are the ones that need to change, not them. Maybe that was his attitude, but whatever it was, it was wrong. It is God who tells us how we are to treat him, not us tell God. And God demands reverence and holiness. And so, because he ignored this warning, this health and safety warning, because he hadn't gone through the proper health and safety training, because he hadn't properly warned them, they must not touch the holy things lest they die. He did the wrong thing. And how did he react? David reacted just as we would react today. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Isaiah. And our instinct is to be angry at God. You can't be that holy. You can't be that unloving. Surely you're a merciful, kind God. Surely you're not that strict. Surely you're easygoing. Surely you want to just save anybody at any cost. Surely if you are willing to, to leave the dwelling place of heaven and come down to our earth on our level, then surely you're much more easygoing than this. It's the same Jesus. And Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. I'm sure David and all of the other Israelites who were with him as they danced before the ark, as, they, as it was being dragged along on that ox cart, were saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. And yet, Isaiah, as he reached out, as he ignored the health and safety warning of God, as he touched that ark, and received the judgment as he underestimated the holiness of God, he perished. And in exactly the same way, not everyone that says to Jesus, you are Lord, you are Lord, with great passion, repeating it, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And this is speaking of the day of judgment. One day Jesus will return. And many people will have underestimated the justice and the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be greatly shocked and surprised at the moment they do so. And they will react undoubtedly as David did. And they too will be angry at God. Why didn't anybody warn us? And then their anger will turn to all of the unfaithful Christians and all of the unfaithful churches that said that God is radically inclusive and really nice and he doesn't care and he's lowered his standards and he's, he's grown up and he's moved with the times and all of the other things that has brought God to an ordinary common level. That has, that has dropped mo God's morality and God's standards to accommodate them to the, the things that please us. And at that moment, when they realize that they have been lied to, they will be betrayed. And many among those that say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these mighty things for you? They will say, Lord, Lord, were we not radically inclusive for you? Were we not easygoing? Didn't we show our wonderful love? Didn't we show that we were more compassionate than you? Didn't we pick through the Bible and pick out the bits that we like and make ourselves feel good? 
And Jesus will say, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Depart from me. And so this passage reminds us that it's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we must treat him with the reverence and respect that he deserves. We must come to him on his terms and not on our own. But I don't want us to dwell on the negative side that's in this passage. I want us also to recognize that this passage ultimately, the thing that should jump out at us first and foremost with utter excitement, is that Jesus and the ark have a blessing for the Gentiles. And yet we can easily miss this. The ark ultimately ended up in, Obed, um, in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And you're wondering to yourself, who are the Gittites? Where do they come from? Well, if we look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 18, it says that uh, uh, all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath, well, there's our clue. Gittites were the inhabitants of Gath, and Gath was that place where the ark was, that place of the Philistines, on the border of Israel and Philistia. And it was there, it was there that that terrible plague broke out. It was there that they loaded onto the back, and there was, it was a demonstration of the power of God in Gath that convinced many, many people that the God of Israel is the true God. And so 600, as we'll read later, 600 Gathites, or Gittites as they were called, uh, followed David. And one of the first to leave, and one of the first to be blessed, was this man, Obed-Edom. And here's the wonderful thing. He had the respect and the reverence that the people of kiriath Jearim didn't have when 70 of them passed, out, passed away. They had uh, this uh, man, this Gentile man, had a greater reverence for the Ark of the Covenant than even David had, and he enjoyed the blessing. This Gentile was included among the people of God and received greater blessings than the Israelites themselves because he understood the enormous respect and reverence that was due to God. He didn't mess with the Ark of the Covenant. He didn't treat it as a tourist attraction. He didn't try to peep inside it. He treated it with the reverence it deserved. He had seen its effects in his hometown of Gath. He recognized who the true God was and he was willing to leave his, uh, his own people behind and join the people of God, the Israelites. He was willing to live in, the, in their midst. And when God saw that, he rewarded him with allowing the representation of the very dwelling place of God in the midst of his people was in his own house. And he lived to be blessed. And how much more are we blessed to have Jesus, the true dwelling place of God among men, the one who became flesh, the one who dwelt among us? How much more of a privilege is it for us to have him dwell in the midst of our hearts by faith and in the midst of his church, where he says, where two or three are gathered in his name, he will be there in our midst. And he is here to bless us. And we have here in the Old Testament this realization that God's desire was never ever just to give a special blessing to the Israelites and to exclude the, uh, the Gentiles from that blessing. No, it was always God's desire to start with the Israelites and then to draw in more and more and more of the Gentiles so that one day all of the Gentiles would have complete access and could call themselves true members of the people of God. And that is what you and I have. And we have it through Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. And so I hope you're excited about this passage. I hope you learn to treat Jesus with a greater reverence and respect that he deserves. And I hope you learn from the mistakes of Isaiah. And I hope that you see the errors of the church today. But I hope ultimately that you're more excited and more thrilled about who Jesus is and what he means to us, that we should have him dwell in our midst, in our hearts, in our church. What a glorious privilege that is. And with that, we have the blessing, this very same blessing that Obed-Edom had and all that he had in his household. Shall we pray? 
Heavenly Father, what a blessing, what a joy, what a privilege. Help us to be thrilled all the more that we know you and we have Jesus dwelling in our midst. Help us to go in that power, to love and serve you. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to conclude our worship now as we sing, There is a Higher Throne. pray that you were thrilled by this wonderful chapter of the Old Testament and there's so much more in the book of ones and true chronicles that help us to appreciate the gospel even more so I hope you'll join us again next week and may God dwell in your heart throughout the whole of this coming week until then may God richly bless you and now will you say the grace with me the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all Evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.